Let's get started. Looks like we have a quorum. I'm very happy to introduce Russ Dedrake today. He's a professor at uh, MIT uh, Aeron Aeronautics and F. Let's see, what is it? How do we say it? ECS is my first home. ECS is your first and home. And then Aero Astro. Aero Astro. That's right, Aero Astro. Um, and uh, so I was talking to um, Russ over dinner last night and today, and he's been telling me about his uh, current work. His two loves are robotic birds and then walking robots that do a very extreme sense of dynamic walking. So in his lab, he's building robots that can actually dodge between trees. They can fly and dodge between trees by turning sideways and ostriches that run very fast. I hope to, uh, he is going to give us a sense of some of those things coming up. These are current projects that are exciting. But I think today his talk is going to be on the thread that ties this, these themes together, which has to do with robust motion planning. Well said. Thank so, you. Uh, please welcome Russ Ted. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming. Uh, right, so I want to talk about exactly right, the thread that sort of ties those two loves together, which is the sort of algorithmic foundations of taking all that planning stuff and making it work on real robots. Um, so I believe in motion planning, right? So uh, that's not, you know, in the people that do walking robots and the like, I, it's a selling, I always start talking to the dynamic walking people saying, you know, there's this thing called motion planning, right, that, uh, that we should all be thinking of. But I, to this audience, I'm, I'm talking to a friendly crowd here who all, uh, who all know and love motion planning algorithms. But, you know, I think motion planning uh, works really, really well, even for really complicated systems. So this is our, you know, little dog robot built by Boston Dynamics. I know you guys have little dog here and have seen little dog a lot. Um, just as an example of motion planning working well, we, uh, towards the end of our little dog program, we spent time to build a very accurate dynamic model. Uh, it turns out to be about 16 state dimensions of this uh, little dog robot in a, in a uh, planar bounding configuration. Okay? We spent a long time doing modeling of this. We modeled, modeled all the motor saturations for it. Uh, we modeled the ground contacts, to, you know, which turned out to be surprisingly difficult because of the interactions of the, the spring and the leg and the ground. But eventually we got a pretty darn good model of the dog. And then we did basically trajectory optimization and rapidly exploring trees. Of course, you guys know rapidly exploring trees. Right in the state space, it took some heuristics. It took the, the right combination of trajectory optimization and, and randomized motion planning. Um, but we could take that dog and basically now take, say, here's the model. Here's your initial condition standing over here. You know, get to the final condition standing over here. You got all this terrain in the middle. Hit go, and, and our motion planning algorithms could, you know, could come up with solutions that would eventually, you know, in a few minutes of computation, you know, get this dog to bound with all the sort of constraints that we thought were. <laughs> For real in the real world to go from point A to point B. That's for me. That you know, in my world, that was an impressive demonstration of, of motion planning. You know, working on a complex model. Here's the other example, right? The other. So imagine if you wanted to fly an airplane through a forest at a really high speed. So it turns out we're we are thinking a lot about it. Just to show you some of the the inspiration here, we've got collaborators at Harvard that are flying real birds through synthetic forests, um, just watching what they can do. Like this is our uh, instrumented pigeon. I really wanted it to be an elite bird, you know, some sort of hawk, some sort of uh, <laughs> falcon. I got a pigeon, you know, but uh, they actually convinced me pigeons are really, really good at flying in clutter, you know, when they come down and get your lunch and then take off again, then you know, they're, they're specialized birds for that sort of urban environment. And just in case you didn't see that, that's just, I mean, it's just beautiful to watch how they can fly through here. They're not perfect, they make some contacts, but they, the way they time their wings, they time their, uh, their maneuvers, they're quite dramatic maneuvers, almost certainly stalling wings in the process and, and, and navigate at high speeds through very cluttered environments is inspirational. We've been collecting data. Uh, this is guy's got a head-mounted camera, right? He's got motion capture on his, on his head and on his back. It turns out, since birds don't succumb with his eyes, we know, we know the orientation of his head, we know where he's looking. So we have, we have exactly sort of what he's seeing through this world, tracking from, about, from, from externally and on, on board everything he sees, and you know, hopefully we'll learn something from the bird. <coughs> but the point is, I can take my models of an airplane of complexity necessary, we hope, to, to do those maneuvers, 
This is a, our sort of agile uh, winger on configuration for an agile UAV. And I can ask it to fly through some obstacle laden field. And I can just crank out, you know, I believe in motion planning. I, I can just crank out solutions that'll, that'll find solutions. So this pretty complicated dynamical system through complicated geometric constraints, right? <coughs> and I can do it even if those models are, are really pretty complex models of the aerodynamics. If I've got post stall effects modeled and, and the like. And, uh, and like Sanjeev said, we're not talking, this picture doesn't quite do it justice. This is the one I use for my, I'll use for my cartoon a lot in the talk. But, but really, we're talking about trying to do knife edges through obstacles that where you couldn't possibly fly um, you know, horizontally or and going through really tight gaps. We're not doing that yet, but that's what our, our goal is. And I believe that given models of the proper sophistication and the geometric description of the world, we're going to be able to find um, very high performance trajectories with these motion planning algorithms. They're, they're, they work really well. Okay. Um, why is that impressive? Why, was the, why are those problems hard? It's impressive to me because um, the dynamics of those, both of those examples, the dynamics are very complex, right? So the dynamics are, are very nonlinear. For little dog, already the manipulator equations that govern the dynamics of the robot are, are nonlinear. Um, but even more, there's very limited control authority, right? So the walking robots are inherently underactuated. Little dog, those, that, those poor motors were speed saturated almost all the time. Certainly in bounding type configurations, we were always at the rails of the, what those motors can do. And if you have limited control authority, then you can't squish nonlinear dynamics. So you sort of are stuck reasoning about the nonlinear dynamics of your system. You can't just use feedback to, to linearize the dynamics. So they're hard in a dynamic way. <laughs> Um, but they're also, those problems are both combinatorially hard. They're, they're, they're problems that planning feels natural, right? So, so you have to decide, am I going to go left or the right of the obstacle? And there's a problem of, of choosing which path among the combinatorial number of paths uh, I'm going to take through the obstacle field, through the, you know, am I going to step on rock number one or skip rock number one and go to rock number two? Traditionally, tools that address the complex nonlinear dynamics and tools that address the um, the combinatorial planning problems haven't always mixed, but you know, but nowadays I think they're starting to really. I think motion planning is really doing a good job. Trajectory motion planning in those kind of problems is working really well. Okay, all right. So what's the problem? Um, the problem is I put it on the robot and it fails, right? I mean, I could. I, <laughs> it's not asking all that much, right? It's like I just don't want to smash into a tree because I spent a really long time building that robot, you know. Um, I don't want to hit a tree at 10 meters per second, right? So I, if I'm planning to the nth degree these beautiful plans that solve amazing geometric constraints, and then I put it on the real system and it doesn't do what I planned, it's pretty frustrating, right? And I think that the next thing we have to do in planning is, is close the gaps between what we've been assuming in planning and what we need to do to work on these really dynamic robots, right? And I think that gap is mostly in robustness, right? So if I take some nominal plan in my cartoon airplane and a cartoon forest, um, you know, that we all know that if I were to make a small change in the initial condition and run the same control tape, my same motion plan through, I might just smash right into the tree, right? The same thing's true if I, if I have small errors in the model, right? If the model wasn't quite what the real dynamics of the system were, the same thing could happen. Um, or if I have disturbances, if there's wind, gust, or if I'm relying on some sensing and uh, and it, it's, it's got noise in the sensors. All, any of these things could contribute to you know, smashing into a tree at 10 meters per second. Uh, <clears throat> so there's a couple of lessons that I want to sort of, I want to uh, you know, start, start the discussion on today. What, first of all, you know, not all plans are created equal. You can sort of tell when I planned this, I tried to push it towards, so on average it was away from an, an obstacle, and that's a pretty good heuristic. But, but in fact, um, Trajectories that look may, may look equally good to a uh, two trajectories that may look equally good to a standard motion planning algorithm. It might be that one of them is living right on the rails of the actuator capabilities and is therefore not stabilizable, or might be in some more subtle way um, very hard to stabilize. Where another plan might be very stable, even though they look kinematically very similar. So we're going to try to find plans that are more naturally robust. And I think to do that, we first need to. Uh, evaluate robustness well, okay? Um, so just to, to keep the cartoons going here, um, let's just think with me for a second about, I want to think about the dynamics of our aircraft as a vector field. So right, in, in general, if I write the equations of my robot as x dot equals f of x u, x being the state, 
you being the input, um, then I could plot, I can make the, uh, put the airplane in any state in this world and ask what does the current x dot look like in that state, right? This is just a visual description of the dynamics of the world. And yet, this is a higher dimensional model. I'm just plotting a 2D slice of that dynamics and projecting the vectors onto that. So if I were to take you know, my airplane and set the control to zero, this particular airplane model is just going to fly straight. That's obviously going to run into a, uh, a tree, in this case, in a lot of configurations. What happens now if I've taken some time to build a motion plan? So for a motion plan, for me, typically um, starts off as a tape, a control tape of control input actions. I'll call it U0 of T, right? So defined over some finite domain, T0 to TF. Okay, if I, if I impose x dot equals f of x, but with that control input tape, the thing that I get out is now a time varying vector field. And um, you have to forgive me, I'm switching between movie formats here, so I'm going to flip between a little bit, but hopefully it'll be almost seamless. And what I get is a time varying vector field, right? The same thing, but as u changes over time, the vector field changes over time. Um, and I want to somehow, if I want to talk about robustness, I need to actually think about that entire vector field over time, how it evolves, and ask harder, it starts to feel like harder questions like, okay, if I started here and I underwent that time varying vector field, am I going to hit an obstacle, right? These are potentially tough questions, okay? So, um, so you know, it, given some particular state, x0, is it going to hit an obstacle? That's a, potentially a tough question when my vector field is already complicated and now moving with time, okay? Naturally, we're all, you know, anybody's natural inclination is I, once I plan this trajectory, I should wrap a feedback controller around it, which we do that too. Um, the type of controllers we often use are, are typically linear off the nominal trajectory, so I'll add some extra terms here as a controller where k is some time varying linear gain. So that changes the vector field. It gives me a different, probably better vector field. Right, so this one's going to um, you know, provably do better at uh, avoiding things, but it doesn't actually change the fundamental problem of analyzing what that vector field is going to do to my dynamics for different initial conditions. Am I going to hit this, the tree? Right, um, but that's that's still just the tip of the iceberg. The really interesting part is when I start having model uncertainty. Right, so um, what if the model is uncertain? This is a simple form of uncertainty. Let's say there's some. Uh, f of x u, but plus some delta, right? And I'll bound delta. I'll give it some some bounds. Uh, this is sort of shorthand notation. I'll just bound delta. There's some um, some bounded perturbation. Now my vector field looks potentially much more complicated, right? So um, now I've got something that looks more like this, right? <coughs> Oops. So I've convinced that SWF is the future, but Mac doesn't support SWF. So that's why I'm using Adobe for my SWFs. And then, okay, sorry, uh, it's a, sort of a one-week uh, overlap with my new video formats. But so now suddenly, what you have to think about if there's robustness problems, if your model is potentially uncertain, you don't have a single vector field. Okay, what you have is at every point a continuum of vectors that could possibly describe your dynamics. Right. So if I'm in this state, it might be that this is the right vector. It might be that this is the right vector. Anything in between might be the right vector. So if I want to do the robustness analysis, the problem is now, given you put me in some initial condition, and I'm governed by this vector field that's pulling me through space, but at any point I could draw from any one of these vectors, can I still say something about am I going to hit the obstacle or not? All right, so that starts being a, a potentially difficult problem to think about. <clears throat> OK, so, so is it going to collide? So, Somehow we need to analyze this very complex, potentially nonlinear, time-varying vector field. Um, it sounds tough, right? If everything was discrete, if we had discrete time, discrete actions, discrete states, then I think dynamic programming is exactly the right solution, and you could you could knock out a, a, a proof of of, of this uh, uh, these types, true or false, very nicely. But in fact, these systems don't discretize well. I, where I was talking with a few of you earlier, I, I, you know, I'm, I've been burned by discretization. I used to be sort of more of a dynamic programming guy. I've been burned by discretization on these dynamic systems too many times. I think these systems do not discretize, discretize well, partly because they have many states, but partly because there's um, potentially large discretization errors that are difficult to bound, even with a fairly coarse um, 
fairly fine discretization. So somehow we want to analyze that vector field with a natively continuous approach. Okay, so that's what I want to advocate here. And there's a precedent, of course. There's this thing called robust control that people in controls have been doing for a long time and doing very, very well, right? So it's the reason that fighter jets work, maybe, right? So you know, I, there's there's proofs out there that a fighter jet, which is net, which is passively unstable, is the the way the story goes. You know, and I can prove that it won't fall out of the sky with five nines of probability, right? So there's a point nine 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 percent chance I'm going to give you a bound that it's not going to fall out of the sky, right? Uh, <clears throat> It's an extremely powerful set of res re results but for robust control, mostly for linear systems, right? They give conditions that is the linear system subject to bounded disturbances um, going to be stable always. Um, and they can even give optimization-based verification of feedback synthesis algorithms. So the real question I want to address today is, are any of those tools, those good, powerful tools from robust design analysis, are they compatible with, can we take advantage of them if we're motion planning people that are thinking about the, the dynamic complexity that I'm interested in and the geometric com com combinatorial complexity that is sort of our strength in motion planning, right? And so if the answer was no, I guess I'd be done already. But uh, the hope is that the answer is yes. I'll tell you one particular approach. It's based on Lyapunov function, uh, a, a Lyapunov function based approach to robustness analysis. And I want to make sure that story comes through. It's not the only approach, but, but I think it's, it's, a, it's a powerful place to start. So how many people sort of eat Lyapunov functions for breakfast and just think about them all the time? All the time. All the time. <laughs> Every day. Uh, OK, so you, you all, you'll be bored for two slides. But, but let me just make sure everybody's on the same page, right? So, um, so this is the way I like to sort of motivate Lyapunov functions. Uh, take the simplest robot in the world, uh, you know, uh, a simple one link pendulum that's going to sit there and, and fall down uh, with gravity. It's just got a pin joint at the, at the top. Okay? I can write the equations of motion for this robot. Right? I can simulate it. No problem. It just falls down. Okay? So given this differential equation where mass, length, right? this is some damping g sine theta, you know, given a differential equation description like that, I should be able to ask you very simple questions like, okay, I'll give you the initial conditions. I'll give you theta zero, theta dot. You tell me what theta is going to be at time t. That's a fair question, right? That's a, you can, I'm giving you the differential equation. I'm giving you the initial conditions. That should be everything you need. OK, I can't tell you the answer to that. I, I'd say, I don't think anybody can tell you the answer to that. If v is 0, then the answer is an elliptic integral of the first kind. If v is not 0, then I, I can't even really get you started. It's, it's, there's there's not, no useful closed form solution to theta of t. OK, so if we're talking about bounding the long-term performance of a pendulum, uh, potentially, you know, in obstacles and stuff like that. If I can't even solve a pendulum, that's a little frightening, right? Uh, that doesn't bode well for the future of the talk here. Um, but there's things that I can say very easily about the pendulum, right? So I ran that simulation. I could tell you, I'm going to go out on a limb and say, you know, that thing, when I, as time goes to infinity, it's going to be at zero. No problem, right? Uh, <laughs> theta at time infinity is going to be zero. But let's think about why I know that. How can I prove that? Well, I can write down the total energy of the pendulum, right? The kinetic energy plus the potential energy, right? And I can tell you pretty quickly that the energy is always going to be going downhill, right? I can tell that just from inspired by intuition because I've got damping in the system. I'm always going to be losing energy, right? And since if the energy is going to be going to zero, and the only place where the energy is zero here is when theta equals zero, the energy function here will actually give me a proof that that thing's going to converge to that fixed point. Right? Simple, intuitive. That's exactly what a Lyapunov function is. I'm going to use, I'm going to bend the Lyapunov functions a little bit away from this, but that's, this is the basic idea of, of Lyapunov functions, right? So we're just going to generalize the idea of energy to more complicated systems, right? In general, I just have to find some bowl. It might be that solving a differential equation for a system could be intractably hard, but as long as I can find some function, some scalar function, I'll call it v of x instead of energy, that's always greater than 0 except for when it equals 0 at, at 0, uh, and which is always going downhill in, in time. So if I, if I differentiate v, right, so partial v, partial x, partial x, partial t, which is just f, if that's always down, going downhill, then it's exactly like my energy argument. I know if I'm always going downhill on this function, then eventually I'm going to get to the origin and everything's stable. Right? The minimum, in this case, x equals 0, is globally asymptotically stable. 
If I can construct that function for complicated systems, I'm golden, right? You can do the same thing. So I think you'd never expect a motion plan to be globally stable, right? The vector fields that I showed you, uh, you know, are not going to be successful for every possible initial condition. You can use the same sort of Lyapunov functions to do more regional, more local analysis, right? So um, here's, a, here's a toy example, one of the simplest nonlinear systems we could do. X dot equals negative X plus X cubed, right? So the reason I like this is um, you can understand everything you want with a simple plot about this dynamical system, right? So the way you understand first order dynamical systems of a single variable is you can just plot X versus X dot. That completely describes it. This one looks like negative X at the origin and then it goes up like X cubed afterwards, okay? And I can just look at this by inspection and tell you everything I need to know about it. So first of all, every place it crosses the origin is a fixed point of the system, right? That's a place where x dot equals zero. Those are my fixed points, okay? And if I look more closely, if I'm looking at this, this is above, this is positive x, which means my flows, if you think of it as a flow, it's going to be moving this way, and it's going to go to this fixed point. This point, x dot is negative, so my dynamics are going to take me this way, so I know that this is going to be a stable fixed point. Neighboring trajectories are going to go to this fixed point, okay? All right, so this one, it's positive on this side, the trajectories are going to diverge, that's an unstable fixed point. Okay, so I know everything about this. I know that the stable fixed point is here, and I know the region of attraction of that stable fixed point is exactly the set from negative one to one, it happens to be, that's where that, that crosses. Okay, this is the last time in this talk you'll completely understand the system, but I'm going to take those tools and I'm going to show you that we can make them work if this is a tree, you know, and, and so there's other things that define the basin um, that, that we can make the same tools work. So you can, you, can, you can find this proof of stability with Lyapunov theory, right? So I'll just run the, run the example here. So if I just use, I'm going to just throw out a function x squared. For now, where I get x squared could be mysterious, but x squared is a standard choice. Um, if I run the, the Lyapunov equations, I put in <laughs> partial v partial x, f dot, that I can get something which is which I can see is exactly less than zero from negative one to one, right? So it's just an energy argument, right? Same thing for the pendulum. I, I know a bunch of things by having the energy for the pendulum, right? I know that that fixed point is stable, but there's more than that. I know if I have an initial energy at time zero, if my energy is five, I will never visit states where the energy is six, right? The Lyapunov function gives you a, a, a very powerful tool for analysis. Okay. So the tool we're going to use for robustness analysis today is the idea of a common Lyapunov function. All right. So imagine I've got an uncertain system, right? I, I, I said plus delta before, but in general, I've just got some function that, some dynamics that are a function of delta, some bounded delta. The Lyapunov story holds almost exactly, right? I've got some uncertain parameters. Now I just have to find, I, if I can find a Lyapunov function, which for every delta, in this family. Every possible disturbance, every possible modeling error, if this dynamics is still less than zero, right, it's, it doesn't have to match the dynamics perfectly, but if no matter where those vectors are, if they're always going downhill on my, my Lyapunov function, I've still got a proof of stability. That's going to be a powerful idea, okay? All right. The example I gave required us to guess a Lyapunov function. It used to be, we've known about Lyapunov functions for a long time. Uh, it used to be very limited what we could do with Lyapunov functions because there had to be this magic step initially where someone conjured up the Lyapunov function for you. Right? If I got a, a, a Rayburn Hopper, nobody's going to write down a Lyapunov function that I can just start thinking about and verifying for a, a Rayburn Hopper. Okay? But things have changed in controls. right? So nowadays, you can actually find Lyapunov's functions using optimization. Right? So in to be exact, for, <clears throat> for smooth systems, you can verify polynomial Lyapunov functions for polynomial systems using convex optimization. And you can even search for Lyapunov functions for polynomial systems as bilinear optimizations, which are sort of EM style convex optimizations. Okay? We've been making these tools. I want to tell you the story of doing this, using those tools to design Lyapunov function proofs of stability and robustness for motion planning. Right? So to take those tools and make them work for motion planning, we've made them work for Lyapunov functions along motion planning trajectories. We've been making them work for systems with 
input saturations, state constraints like obstacles. We've been making it work for trigonometric systems because every robot we, we use pretty much has got sines and cosines in the dynamics. We've been making them work for systems that have impacts, systems that have periodic limit cycles, and we've been doing some stochastic stuff. Okay? So here's the pendulum example again. So if I wanted to do, take my pendulum and now put a motor at the top and do a control law at the top, okay? Uh, <clears throat> Well, the way I, I've been teaching uh, undergraduate controls this, this term, right? So the way we do it in undergraduate controls, we, we linearize the system around the top, we'll, design, we'll do some pole placement, and we'll design a controller that, that works around where, in the top. And if we get too far from where that linearization was valid, then our, our controller just fails and it falls down. And, 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 and well, normally, actually normally it spins until we turn it off, but uh, that's a failure of my demo. Um, <clears throat> so, so I can take that linear controller at the top use a Lyapunov argument, construct a Lyapunov function automatically with optimization that proves that if the fixed point here at pi zero was initially unstable, under the linear feedback law, those initial conditions are a stable region of attraction for the linear system on the non, the, the linear controller on the nonlinear system. Does that make sense? Every initial condition inside this gray region has a Lyapunov proof of stability that's gonna get me to the, back to that goal. Super cool, okay? But now we want to do it for motion planning trajectory. So for motion planning, I've got to do, for, to swing up from the bottom, I have to do something more. So I'm going to, I'm going to put chomp, or I'm going to put trajectory optimization, I'm going to put RRTs to work. I'm going to design a trajectory that finds a control torque, which is going to pump up the energy in this pendulum and swing it up to the top. That's this blue line moving through state space. I don't even close the feedback law around it, so it's probably pretty stable. And the question is, can I compute a Lyapunov function for that, to, to argue, to understand what the vector field around that does. And in fact, I can. I can compute now time varying Lyapunov functions that are going to surround this trajectory and give me a bound on where the vector fields can take me. And the bound we're interested in this case is the one that dumps into the final configuration. So I can come up with a Lyapunov proof saying if the initial conditions started in this region, they're going to stay in this tube and they're going to find their way into this region. And I've got a proof of stability for a swing up controller, uh, potentially with, with modeling errors, uh, getting to the top, okay? For finite time uh, control, stability is not strictly required. It's just a finite time analysis. So it works for, pretty, for unstable systems, it works for stable systems. Okay, so we can do the same sort of computations on motion plans in more complicated situations. So take my airplane example now. I've got saturations on how fast it can yaw, how fast it can, uh, it, it, can, it can rotate. I've got geometric obstacles now. I, can, I told you I can create the motion plans. I can also compute the funnels, right? So I can compute, I can algebraically analyze the vector field, right? So if I can write down the description of that vector field uh, on paper, then without doing any discretization or anything, I can compute this Lyapunov function. This is a level set of the Lyapunov function that tells me what the vector field is going to do, a bound on what the vector field is going to do. Okay? And if I want to take into account the obstacles, I can start, if I've computed the funnel in the right way, and every subset of a Lyapunov function is also a Lyapunov function, so I can just trim these funnels and handle all the geometric constraints. Does that make sense? Matt's sort of frowning, yeah? So this is a sub-level set of a Lyapunov function, which is going to guarantee if I stay in here, if this is, this is like energy less than two, right? Or Lyapunov value less than two, then I'm going to stay this is another place where the Lyapunov level is less than two. If I started with less than two, I'm going to stay with less than two, so I'm not going to hit that obstacle. Yeah? And I'm not going to hit the obstacle. Yeah. Okay? <coughs> I just pressed press the wrong button, sorry. Okay, so how do I do it for robustness? So now I have x dot equals f of x plus delta, right? The, tra the trajectories. So I'd say most people in motion planning so far have done very well by planning trajectories through state space. If you're asking about robustness of trajectories and you have any sort of uncertainty in your model like this, a trajectory can't be robust, right? If I take a nominal line through state space and I say that the model is, is off by some delta, then that trajectory is almost certainly not even a feasible solution of the new dynamical system of the slightly different, if I change my mass by 0.2, then suddenly that trajectory isn't even a solution to the original dynamical system. 
and it's certainly not a robust solution. Trajectories cannot be invariant. Lyapunov functions can be invariant, right? I can still prove, like I said, with the common Lyapunov function argument, that, I, that even if my model is wrong, if I start inside a funnel, I'll stay inside a funnel, okay? So this funnel is a fundamental flip in what we're planning. Instead of planning with trajectories, I think we should plan with funnels, and then, then we can talk about robustness of our motion plans, okay? All right, so how does it work? So, so it works for, for complicated systems, too. My, my example for, for Steve and the dynamic walking community is, are these, um, my favorite sort of simple walking models. Hartmut thinks about these a lot. Right, the, this is a compass gate, happens to be a compass gate walking model. You put it on a small ramp and it'll walk. Hartmut's walk better than mine, but that's okay. Um, I can prove stability. It's okay, it's okay, yeah. uh, okay so, um, right, so, so just this is just a sort of passive dynamic walker. I put it on a ramp, give it a small push with some simple assumptions about the dynamics. This system, naturally, you could call it a motion plan, you could call it, it's the natural thing that's expressed by the physics. It goes through a periodic cycle in state space, right? That's punctuated by hybrid events, which is when the foot hits the ground. There's an impulsive collision at the foot, instantaneous change in velocity, a switch in the, in the legs, that's a stance leg, that's why I changed the color. Another instantaneous impulse in velocity, and then around again. Right, so this is a really tough dynamical system to think about now. It's a hybrid dynamical system. It was already nonlinear, but now we've got impulsive events that are happening. We've got specific guards in state space. But you know what? We can do that too. The, the, the Lyapunov function approach can still hold. We've got a construction now which will automatically generate Lyapunov functions, provably generate Lyapunov functions that will prove stability of a limit cycle under hybrid uh, impacts. Okay? I decided not to go into the, all the math of the tools today, but, uh, but I want you to know that those tools exist and, and sort of what their limitations are, right? So, um, so maybe the head-to-head -head comparison would be what can you do with an algebraic Lyapunov function approach compared to, say, a dynamic programming approach, right? So the scaling of these convex optimization problems is polynomial in the number of decision variables. The decision variables are, are, are grow polynomial with the state of dimension, state dimension, so it's a polynomial algorithm. I, you know, if I was, you know, if I was a convex optimization person, I would stop there and just tell you it's polynomial. But, but actually, it's polynomial with a really big exponent, right? So, so in practice, uh, these get really big, really fast. Um, we're doing, we're computing Lyapunov functions for systems up to about 11 states, and the people who, who, who've been doing this for a long time and pushing the dimensionality are doing it 15, he's told me 20 more recently, who says, Maybe I can do 20 dimensions for, uh, for computing the up and out functions for the time invariant systems. Um, the funnels along trajectories are, are more expensive because you, you have to think about time too. Uh, we're doing up to about eight states. But this is just the tip of the iceberg, I think. I'm sort of willing to bet on these tools because I think discretization is sort of, we've been discretizing things for a long time. We're up to maybe five or six dimensions and we're not going to get a lot farther. Um, you know, these are working pretty nicely in, in a few, you know, handfuls of minutes on, on big systems with 11, eight states, and they're using optimization engines that, were, that are sort of very, uh, very new, very, very imperfect. Uh, so I think they're going to only get better pretty fast. Uh, <clears throat> the biggest problem with them, if, for those of you that are thinking about implementing sums of squares optimization, is, be, is that uh, there's numerical difficulties still, right? So if you, if you download a linear programming solver from, from IBM, uh, you, you, it'll just munge uh, you know, optimization problems with thousands of decision variables, hundreds of thousands of decision variables. It'll never tell you there's a numerical error, right? Our, our tools are relatively new. The, commu the community's tools are relatively new for semi-definite programs. They still say, oh, sorry, I hit numerical difficulties, and oh, sorry, I can only do this many decision variables, but they're getting better fixed. I expect dramatic improvements. <clears throat> so the Lyapunov function gives us approach gives us a really powerful way to analyze the vector field in a continuous way and talk about robustness of a, of a motion plan. I think the only real fundamental limitation of that approach is this assumption of smoothness and convexity. Okay, so it's not going to tell me to go left or right around an obstacle. It's only going to analyze smooth vector fields. Okay, so that's why combining it with motion planning is such a nice. Thing. So, so the, the combination with motion planning is what allows us to address both the dynamic complexity of the task 
which comes from the Lyapunov, and the combinatorial complexity, which comes from the, from the um, motion plane. All right, so, so if I'm advocating funnels as a way to talk about robustness of motion plans, does the ability to comp efficiently compute funnels change the way we do motion planning, right? There's a couple ways that it might change it, right? So the first thing, compared to a first sort of tangible difference, compared to a trajectory, um, you know, a funnel takes out a finite volume of state space. Every time I take some time to compute a funnel, I haven't just designed an infinitesimally small part of state space away, I've solved a continuous finite volume of state space, right? So I can actually fill a space with a finite number of funnels. And that's the idea of funnels that, that uh, Matt says I should credit Erdman and, and, and so on, and Revert's in here somewhere, and we had this discussion, but we don't really know where it came from, right? Okay, so, um, so for the pendulum, the way you, one way to do it is to just design a particular motion plan, fill the space with, a, with a, a, the local space with a funnel, and just design a handful of trajectories until you've, you can some say, in some sense, on an offline planning way, completely solve the problem by filling the space with funnels. And the solution is of the form that every initial condition that's inside a funnel is guaranteed to get to the goal. It's not guaranteed to get there optimally, but it's guaranteed to get there. And maybe you could call that a complete solution uh, to a planning problem. All right? And the algorithms, instead of saying probabilistically complete to find a path from start to the goal, you can actually talk about something stronger. You can talk about probabilistic feedback coverage, right? Which, which says that in the limit, as I draw and add enough funnels, I will cover every initial condition that could possibly get to the goal, will get to the goal, okay? So you can construct examples where you say, here's my goal. I've constructed an example where I want to cover the cyan region. I've designed a dynamical system which can never cross the red line. And it'll successively approximate this with, with funnels until it completely fills in that line and solve the, solve the control problem to the best of its ability. So that works for a bunch in, in, uh, in models and simulation. We can design robust controllers now for a huge class of systems that I, that I care deeply about, you know, underactuated systems, carpools, acrobats, compass gates, right? So here's, here's a carpool in practice running an l 2 tree policy, right? It's not the hardest control problem we've done, but it shows, it's good to see that it works in, you know, we got over the, the hurdles of the real world, right? Okay. The only reason that it's geometrically difficult is because there's the rails at the end, which you'll slam into if you're not careful. And uh, the algorithm, you just say stabilize it at the top. It fills the space so that every initial condition, as soon as the red light comes on, it'll, it'll, it'll provably get up to the top. Uh, it's the way we did perching. So I know Rick Corey came and gave a talk uh, not so long ago about, um, about perching aircraft. So r when Rick was giving the talk, we were still mostly doing single trajectories and, and feedback on sing simple trajectories. But by the time Rick graduated, we were um, filling the space with funnels in order to stabilize the, the trajectories of our perching aircraft. And we could then take our, uh, Rick could take this plane, shoot it off into a motion capture arena and land on a, on a wire. All right, so pretty different problems dynamically, but they work with the same sort of underlying technology. And we can do it for walking, right? So this is our compass gate walker. If I have my nominal limit cycle of the compass gate, then I can, the, the story goes that if I want to plan with funnels instead of with trajectories, then I, I reason about the initial conditions which I don't need to stabilize, right? If small perturbations around steady state, I maybe don't have to do anything about. My nominal walking gate will, will handle those cases. There's only a handful of big perturbations that if I plan a recovery motion for that, and I think about all the regions where that, initial, that controller, that recovery motion will work, then I can fill the space with a handful of recovery motions so that it'll recover from all kinds of initial conditions. And at some point, I'll be done. I, all, by randomly sampling here, uh, I will have covered the entire volume of space that, that's possible to cover. This is our compass gate robot that's using that, that algorithm. Um, this is just a few of the, it's still uh, work in progress. This is just showing it running the, the balancing controller. This is showing it taking a step exactly to the top and then turning off and falling down. And this is the, uh, you know, the stable, stabilized limit cycle, right? Before we turned on the toes for the first time. <laughs> and that was where the wire ran out. 
but that'll be working pretty well soon. Uh, I threw this in. This is uh, when I was talking to Sid. I threw this in right after talking to Sid, right? So, um, so one of the things that happens for all that planning to work on the walking is that we have we've had to make those planning algorithms work for planning and verification through complicated multi-contact hybrid situations. So the problem of interacting with uh, with the ground and having collisions and contacts start and stop uh, is very similar to what you might want to do in a cluttered environment, let's say, uh, for grasping. So maybe you could use this stuff for grasping. It depends how much you care about the dynamics. It might be overkill to think of, to worry about the stability of the dynamics where I'm reaching, but if the objects have some dynamics, then, then it might be exactly the kind of tools you need for, for robust manipulation. I don't know. I'm not a manipulation guy. Okay. <clears throat> um, so offline planning, I think, does make sense with funnels. I think if you have funnels, then you can try to fill a space with funnels. Online planning with some robustness guarantees is also possible with, with funnels, right? So, so let's take the, the example of flying through the forest. Well, almost certainly I don't know where the trees are when I start, so I have to do something more clever, right? I have to plan sort of in an incremental way with a limited horizon and continue to, to, to update my plan as new information comes online. If you have a library of funnels, then you can still do that with the same sort of robustness guarantees. The funnel computations are efficient, but they're still offline. So what we do is uh, we change the way we compute funnels so that we can pre-compute families of funnels that we can pull out of, out of a deck at runtime, right? So um, let's see. We're going to use the same robustness analysis again. Uh, the same way we add, we ask and say, okay, the mass might be between 0.9 and 0.1, and I want it to work for every one of those masses. We can do the exact same thing to make a parameterized library of trajectories where we say, okay, my goal is going to be uncertain at runtime. My nominal trajectory is going to be uncertain at runtime. So, so the same math actually allows you to make parameterized motion planning libraries, which, for instance, if I have one funnel that sort of goes here, I can translate at runtime or, or change its, the, the parameters of the motion plan at runtime and have a funnel that's robust to those translations and still prove stability. Okay? And that gives me the ability to plan online with funnels here. All right, so here's uh, you know, the airplane throwing down funnels. It's actually throwing down funnels further in advance than it looks, but it's, uh, it was too hard to see the airplane when you throw down too many funnels. Okay, so we, this is the screen. You can't see past the screen, and it's throwing down funnels as it goes and uh, planning provably safe online plans given all the information uh, that it has to date. Okay, so that works pretty well, but I have a very simple wrench I can throw in to break everything, right? So um, with this, this MIRI project, uh, we decided we're going to try to do vision-based control, okay? So I've avoided vision so far, and one of the reasons is because I throw vision into the loop and it breaks everything, okay? Uh, why does it break everything? What, how, do I, how would I do robust control with vision in the loop? Suddenly I've got, I'm going to throw wind in, I'm going to throw, say the, the obstacles are uncertain, right? Um, robust control can fail, right? Um, when I have large uncertainty due to my control authority, and I ask for a Lyapunov function that proves with probability one that I'm going to succeed, it'll just say, sorry, there's no proof of, of probability one that I'll succeed, right? And perceptual errors aren't small bounded up perception, you know, errors in my model, right? Perceptual systems, you know, vision systems are going to tell me, oops, I, I didn't see that tree, sorry about that. Or, uh, or, oops, there was a tree right in front of you, sorry about that. Um, it's not something I can bound with, like, with a bounded distribution, it's hard to do to think about Gaussian representations. So you're going to have to relax that assumption, I think, to do vision-based control. And we've been, we've been working on that too now. So now we can, we can do the same exact story, but give a probability guarantee instead of a, a probability one guarantee. So <clears throat> we can give you stochastic funnels. What's the idea for stochastic funnels? Well, the, instead of a calling it a Lyapunov function, we have to start calling it a, a super martingale of the dynamics. A super martingale of the dynamics is one, instead of going downhill with probability one, if you get, if it's enough to show that if the expected value of my dynamics is downhill over this function, same thing, it's an energy which on average is going downhill, then I can give rigorous bounds on the probability of leaving some region of the funnel, okay? Uh, we do almost super, super martingales, and we look over pretty uh, sharply uh, scaling functions, and we can give now probabilistic bounds for complicated systems using the same thing. So here's an example on a quadrotor. 
where I'm going to blow a quadrotor around with a Dryden wind gust model. Okay? Simple quadrotor using an LQR controller at the top, okay? blowing it with wind just to show you the magnitude of the noise. I can now ask a question like this. So the, the, the Dryden wind gust model is a, is a, a Gaussian process pushed through a, a two-state linear system. So it it's, will eventually go arbitrarily far from the fixed point. And I'm going to ask, what's the probability of leaving some region like this in a finite time? Okay. I can do it again by constructing a Lyapunov-like function, looking at the expected value of the process, and do a finite time stochastic verification. This system is eight states, if you include the state of the wind and everything, which you estimate. Uh, <clears throat> it's, uh, it happens in about five minutes on our computer. And we can come up with now stochastic. This is a, a plot in the log scale of a funnel, um, a, a plane, a, a slice of the funnel for the, for the quad rotor, looking at the probability of entering the re red region. Okay? And the cool thing is, it's sort of um, surprisingly tight. So I can tell you from this um, that if I simulated that for one hour with gust of that magnitude, I can bound the probability failure from the initial condition to be 0.2. There's a 0.2 chance, 20% chance that I'm going to fail. That's a, that's, the fact that it's not zero or the fact that it's not one is, it means that we've done a pretty good job bounding the probability of leaking. So if you compare this to DP in the one case or compare it to Monte Carlo evaluation, right? A few minutes in sums of squares optimization could comp compete with potentially you know, lots and lots and lots of one hour simulations. And it gives surprisingly tight bounds. We're hoping that this will allow us to do you know, verification of vision-based control with perceptual uncertainty and possibly even not only optimize the controller, but optimize the vision system under the same optimization. OK, here's one last crazy idea that I want to tell you sort of about that. So I told you, I, so far I've tried to set up the dichotomy of, so I said that, that uh, the, the control theoretic tools, the Lyapunov function tools are really good for smooth vector fields, right? And the planning is really good for going around obstacles and thinking about geometric constraints. OK, here's one sort of crazy idea. Uh, I really don't know yet if it's a good idea or if it's a crazy idea. OK, but um, we can use the robustness analysis again and bend it in another way. Let's, Let's take our non-smooth vector field. A vector field that goes around an obstacle has to be non-smooth. It has to split here, right? Uh, but let's approximate it with a smooth function, OK? I'm going to approximate the vector, vector field with a smooth function. It's, in fact, we use rational functions to, to try to, to handle discontinuities. We're going to approximate the whole thing with a smooth function globally here. And then the errors that we get from our approximation of approximating a non-smooth thing with a smooth thing, we're going to put a robustness bound on that. Okay? We're going to say, sure, I'm going to verify the red vector field, but I know that it makes errors up to that magnitude. And it's a sort of a crazy idea to say, we can actually do smooth global analysis, accepting that there's limitations that are fit, to, to solve globally, convexly, a very geometric looking combinatorial problem. And it actually works. For simple domains, it actually works fairly well. We can, it's, we can bound the probability. We can, we can say we can find their initial conditions, which with, with absolute prob uh, with, with probability one or bounded probability, we will never enter a, an obstacle region. Right? It's not going to necessarily. We're not sure yet if it's going to scale to very very complex geometries, but it's a sort of an interesting crazy idea. Okay. All right. So I'm trying to. I, I, I'm done. I'm going to get off the soapbox now here. I'm trying to say that that robustness with funnels is a way to think about motion planning uh, on real robots. Um, Here's the limitation. I still think it's a very model-based approach. That's not necessarily a bad thing. I think a better model means tighter bounds and higher performance control. I think that's realistic. I don't think you can expect super high performance out of a dynamic robot unless you have some sort of model and some sort of plan. Um, there's limitations. I think you're only as good as your ability to do state estimation if you're doing full state feedback type controllers. So it requires good state estimation. And we're, we're including the observer dynamics in our verification, but it's still tough, right? And control of these systems is fundamentally very model dependent. So there's limitations. There's still challenges going forward. Okay? We're working hard on system identification. And I think there's still a lot more connections to the robust design and analysis world that, we're, that we'll continue to exploit. But it's a start. OK. Right on time, right? So, um, <clears throat> so the story I wanted to tell you today was that I think robust verification plus motion planning can really let you do rigorous and practical controllers for really hard problems in robotics, right? We're going to leverage the motion planning to handle the, the geometric constraints. We're going to handle the Lyapunov functions to handle the smooth part. 
Uh, I showed some examples from Lego locomotion, maybe manipulation, I think navigation in cluttered environments. And I think planning with funnels really works well. It allows sparse library tra trajectory libraries, it allows discussions of robustness. I think we can push motion planning to the point where we're getting really, um, really high performance at the limits without sacrificing our rigorous theoretical guarantees. And I'll just end by showing a few sort of fun things coming up. So um, with Jerry Pratt, like Sanjeev said, we're working on trying to make a robotic ostrich that can run 20, 30, 50 miles an hour. The reason we think we can do that is because uh, Jerry's uh, collaborator, Johnny, has this crazy leg design that if he shakes it with his hand, uh, gets ground speeds of 50 miles an hour, okay? And gets swing clearance um, that he's, he's getting 50, more than 50% of his leg swing clearance for more than 70% of the stride, okay? He's got a, cl a clutch in here that can bear load during stance. It's an amazing leg design, okay? And it's with no motors, right? It's just his hand on the top. So potentially it's very light. And we started simulating this. This is, like I said, it's work with Jerry here. Um, and we've got this robotic ostrich now that uh, in simulation at least is running about 25 miles an hour. Uh, this one was 22 something. And the crazy thing is that it's actually open loop stable in these running, in these <laughs> running trees, okay? So as, I, as we design our controllers, I'm optimistic just because all I have to do is not screw it up. <laughs> I'll let that run and I'll take any questions. Thanks for your attention. Yeah. So your point about the model is, I think, really well taken because uh, the pigeon was amazing. I'm going to guess it doesn't know much math, right? <laughs> it's a bird brain. Right? And, and yeah. So how do we do it? How do they do it? I mean, I, I think the idea of having these libraries is probably right, but somehow, I guess they're not doing any proofs, right? They're, they're practicing? Or... Good, so I think, I think <laughs> biology is not doing sums of squares convex optimization. Yeah. I'd be willing to go out of a limb and say that. Uh, I, I do think that the libraries of, you know, and sort of the idea that you have a, a, something you know how to do, you know, swing a tennis racket or whatever, and you know sort of, a, you know, a number of places where I would, I would choose to, to use that action, you know, sort of a, some sense of where that works. I do think, you know, from introspection, from really no justification, but that's sort of consistent with what I think what my biology might be doing. But in practice, you know, I think that the tools we have for our robots are pretty different from the tools from biology. So I, it, it doesn't really matter to me too much if it's the same as what biology does. I think it's sort of, the birds are surprisingly random, right? So you run the same bird, the same obstacle course 10 times, it'll take nine different trajectories, right? Okay. And, one, and the tenth one will hit the pole. Right? So, <laughs> uh, so, so it's not clear that they're doing optimal control. Although it's pretty clear that they're not doing optimal control. Uh, it's not clear if they're using libraries or not. But we, we can at least know when, you know when they're starting to use visual feedback, because we can watch their head sort of turn and when they can start banking. We can ask questions about when they need to know what they need to know. The exact decision making is going to be hard to interrogate, and it's not clear if we want to copy them. Yeah. these funnels have something to tell us about which of two systems is more robust? Yeah, absolutely. So there's a, so this is, this is a, this is a set of sort of glasses you can put on to suddenly see something new about your dynamical system. You can see the, the basins of attraction of your dynamical system if you, if you start computing these funnels, right? The caveat is that it's not a perfect fit to the, it's, a, it's an inner approximation of the basin of attraction. So I can't guarantee I found exactly the basin of attraction. I guarantee that it's a, the basin of attraction is bigger than the funnel I give you. So there could be, it could be, if you give me two systems, I find a bigger funnel for one than the other. It's a pretty good bet that that's a more stable system, a more robust system. It's not an absolute guarantee. It could be that I just was able to fit that first system better. But I think as a design tool, so you know, we've been talking with Mark Kukowski about perching, and we, we're starting to use the, um, the, the basin of attraction calculation as a way to quickly evaluate mechanical designs and pick the one that has the biggest region of attraction as, you know, as a way to sort of think about a design tool, right? 
Uh, we'll see. We'll see if that turns out to be useful. But it's it's a very fast way to certainly quickly inspect the dynamics of your machine. But if you can fill the space with funnels, no matter how whether they're big or small funnels, do you even care? So there's still I can only do what the machine's cap physically capable of, right? So absolutely, I care. And uh, you know, so so it might be that that a better mechanical design means I can I can build funnels from more places. And better controllers, better mechanical designs mean bigger funnels, which means I can I can I fill the space with less funnels, right? It'll be much more efficient and, and potentially. And there's also places where you'll have, you know, you can't ask for robustness. There's like if if the ground is too uncertain, my control authority is too weak, I get, the funnel will fail. It'll say uh, there is no no controller that will stabilize this with probability one. So mechanical design still matters a lot. And I definitely am not putting that to the side. Yeah. Yeah, it's me. Thanks for that. Question, Mike. Yeah, sure. Um, so if I understand the optimization correctly for the uh, function, so sort of unfair to the optimal function, sort of what we're trying to do is the get to adapt the parameters to play the optimal function and can't adapt the cost. So have you considered, like, is it a much harder optimization if you allow the optimal function to vary, say, so that's exactly what we're doing in the in the in the parameterized function. So it's so. Um, oh, so there's there's a couple of different parameters in play, right? So there's the parameters that define the Lyapunov function. Um, you know, so my 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 case before was x squared. I could have done, you know, two times x squared, three times x squared. That could be a free parameter that I fit. There's also a question of whether I want to fit a Lyapunov function around a nominal trajectory or a different one. It turns out that fits in exactly to the robustness analysis. So I can I can have a parametrized Lyapunov function, which set which I, I say if I change this parameter between one and two, it's exactly like verifying is the mass between one and two. So those things fit exactly together, and then that's how you get the parametrized uh, funnels that you could pull out at runtime. Yeah. Yeah. So it's because they're continuously parameterized, we technically have an infinite set. Um, they always have some finite volume on the input and the output. So we should, so locally we'll always be able to fit a funnel, right? Uh, if we were to find ourselves trapped in a corridor, right, that then, then unless we have some maneuver that will always, you know, so so on our plane, the way we do that is we have a prop hang funnel, right? So oh crap, I just flew into a closet, you know, prop hang. And then we sort of have a contingency plan that does something like that. Okay, so we, we have to have something like that just to guarantee that there's always a solution. But given that, the construction of the funnels is such that, that if you have funnels of finite volume, you should always be able to fit them into the next one. It's not that uh, you, you shouldn't be able to get into the problem where um, I had one here, one here, they didn't quite snap together because I can move them continue, I can deform them continuously until they line up and have some non-zero overlap. I have a question. Sure. Yeah. Well, anybody else thinks of the last question after that. So you're thinking about this from a control side. You even thought about what happens if you have uh, some of the vagaries that you get from perception. You have something back to say to people who think about the perception side. So that says, okay, well, you know, given this kind of mechanism, we need to be able to see out this far. We need to be able to see uh, with this much. Um, Resolution or accuracy or whatever metrics. I mean, is that is that fall out of your? Um, that would be analysis? fantastic. So, so can we do that? So, for a particular system, it's it's a bit like Steve's question, right? So, for a particular system, you could say I could change a parameter and quickly see the effect now that it had on the robustness of my system, right? So, if I if I start changing my mechanical design a little bit, change the spring in my leg, how does that change the size of the funnel? You could do the same sort of thing. Let's say, let's say I've got a vision system that's got some parameters. I have to trade off, you know, focus. I don't know if I, if I want to focus longly or, or, or distant. I'm probably showing off my naivety about vision here, but uh, you know, some some parameter you care about in the vision system, you could change that parameter, watch how it affects the size of the funnels, for instance, and get a handle on how those parameters would affect the overall robustness of the system. The idea is if you ha if you can quickly evaluate the the regional stability. 
And if you, and you could do something like that, then, then now you can actually optimize, right? So I could explicitly say, I'm gonna optimize the performance of these parameters in my vision system in order to maximize the region of the funnel, right? So you could formulate joint optimizations over the controller and the vision system. This is the dream, we're not doing it yet. Uh, that would allow you to just tune those parameters in a vision system and watch, watch it change the funnels and actually optimize until the funnel is as big as possible, right? Backing off higher level heuristics sounds like maybe the most important thing we could do, but maybe the hardest thing we could do. We're, we're, you know, I'm trying to, we're, right now we're in the game of analyzing a particular system discovered by a particular set of differential equations and giving you know, efficient, fast analysis. Uh, backing, you know, raising that to a higher level, saying that vision systems for fast flying vehicles will always do this, that's a harder question that, that we don't have an answer for yet. Yeah. One last question. Yes, um, so you began to talk saying, um, showing the example of Little Dog, where you say, um, we, we come up with this really good model of the, of the system and uh, we can generate really good trajectories. And then you say, this doesn't work in reality, so we're going to consider it in the system. But you still need a good model of the system to do all this analysis. Um, what happens when you, when you don't have a good model of the system, or you don't even have a model? Is there any uh, hope that you can do some similar analysis uh, in a more reinforcement or data-driven approach? Ah, so you, th you threw a, uh, a curveball at me at the end there. But, uh, but so, so let's just think about in the model-based approach. So, so let's say I, I, I say my, the dynamics of my system are x double dot equals u plus delta and like the entire dynamics of Little Dog are just hidden in the delta, right? Uh, I could write down that model, and it would probably say, I can't give you a proof for that. The better that I make my dynamics, and the smaller I make my delta, roughly means the, the more performance I'm going to be able to get out of my system. There's a, there's a continuum of what I can do. The better my model, the smaller the uncertainty bounds, the more aggressive I'll be able to be. That's a natural sort of trade-off, and that's what happens in the algorithm. If you start with a data-driven thing, um, I think there's still a big, I mean, so I, 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 oft, I often, in the fluid dynamics half, half of our lab, we still do reinforcement learning, okay? And these things, there's a couple of natural connections, there's a couple of things that I don't know how to connect yet. But I do think, ultimately, that you're gonna build the conservative, sort of best controller that you, that you can, using model-based, using uncertainty, and then inside the class of stable controllers, you can use data-driven optimization to, to tweak out the performance. That's a very natural thing that would potentially combine data-driven approaches with model-based robust approaches. If you want your data-driven approach to exceed the capabilities of your robustness, that's a tougher question, but an important one. I'm not really yeah. a question. Yeah. Is there any way to access the video of the pigeon head cam? Or it would be really oh sure. Uh, do I have it on my laptop? I don't know. Um, I I I can find them and show you. But I, I think that they actually just I can show you the really bad one that was a shaky camera. But we got a brand new one and I just got it. and It's not on my laptop yet. I well, let's see if I can find that really bad one. <laughs> just know that it's like less blurry. Now the first one, the camera would shake all the time. I might just be looking at the experimenter. Okay. <laughs> okay, so now we have the same thing where the camera doesn't shake, okay? We even have some with pursuit. Yeah, it's pretty funny, they just... Okay. Eventually he's going to fly again. Uh, wouldn't it be, wouldn't it be... Yeah. There he goes. So we updated the hardware and we have much better videos now, but I haven't downloaded it yet. There you go. Sorry. All right, let's thank you. Okay.